So uh, I'll get started. And the topic that is on hand for us is a very significant one. It's important for each one of us as Christians. Sanctification or a progressive work of God and man both where man cooperates with God. It's a process that makes us more and more free from sin and more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ in our actual lives. And therefore, since we need to cooperate with God in this process of becoming more and more confirmed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, we yield ourselves to God as men who have been bought from death into life. That's sanctification. We become more and more like Christ in our lives. Now, when you want to talk about sanctification, we could come at it from various angles. The fact of the matter is, it's a huge topic in the New Testament. In fact, every epistle talks about exhortations to the churches, talks about exhortations to individual Christians as well. And even warning passages that are given in the New Testament is to help us in our sanctification as we progress to become more and more in our actual lives to be confirmed to the image of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So like I mentioned, there are various ways in which we could look at this, but we have three different days in which to look at this topic. So I thought, having thought about this for a while and having, having prayed about this, um, I would come at it on these three days from three different angles. And since you're all young people listening, let me say that we would look at three different flavors of this. Three different flavors or three different angles from which to come at the same core of the topic or sanctification. Right? So today we're going to look at sanctification from the perspective of living a cross-shaped life. To live a cross-shaped life is to live or, or progress in our sanctification. To live a cross-shaped life is to progress in our sanctification. Tomorrow, we will be coming at it from a different flavor or tasting a different flavor of it or coming at it from a different angle. The third day, we will, uh, we will look at it from a totally different angle and uh, or a totally different flavor and taste it from that angle as well. Okay, so let me begin with an illustration here and then we'll move forward. About 100 years ago, a young man from a very wealthy family in the United States, he entered Yale University. His family intended that after he finished the course, he finished his degree, he would enter a suitable career and make money in America so he could support the family as well. But God had different plans. God gripped his heart through the course with the needs of China. And he volunteered to go to China with the gospel, much to the dismay of the family and friends who wanted to see him in a great career. He left America and he wanted to go to China, but he never made it to China. He succumbed to a disease before reaching those distant shores. After his death, a small note was found in his baggage. And that note summarized his entire life. Now listen, please. The note said, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. No reserve, no retreat, no regrets. Since the other uh, topic that you heard about is on mission, I thought I'd start with an illustration like this. But an opening story like this must bring to our mind several questions. What is the perspective that you and I need to have to live a life like that? What is the perspective that you and I need to have to live a life like that? A pandemic like COVID-19 that is all around us right now must jolt us into asking such serious questions. Even as right now we are in the midst of a lockdown. The answer that the Apostle Paul gives to that question that we raised is that you and I must live a cross-shaped life. You and I must live a cross-shaped life. 
What is a cross-shaped life? A cross-shaped life is one that has at its center the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear me? A cross-shaped life is something that has at its center the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a life that knows the power of his resurrection. It is a life that shares in his suffering and becomes like him in his death. And so, although at this time, presently as we live in this world, through the power made available to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we also, in our lives, need to be confirmed to him in his death, which means our lives forever ought to be marked by the cross. That is a cross-shaped life. So let me raise this question here before we move forward. How do we live this cross-shaped life, whether there's a pandemic around us or not? Now, often when the world is in dismay and uh, people are distraught about things, it is easy to think about God, especially in a situation like this in which we find ourselves. But what after the pandemic, when the world returns to normalcy under God's will? We need to think about this question very seriously. We need to live the cross-shaped life right now. As we find ourselves in the midst of this pandemic, as well as live the same kind of a life, even after things return to normalcy. So let's use this lockdown time, especially this time that we'll be spending for these three days in ABC for Teens, and ask ourselves this serious question so we can make the necessary course correction in our Christian life. The passage that we're going to be looking at this morning is a very significant one in the letter that the, uh, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. This passage helps to tie together several items in this letter. Several themes come together in this passage. Paul, so far, up till this passage in the epistle, has been highlighting the theme of joy in suffering. In other words, he is talking about living a cross-shaped life. Again, a life that has at its center the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in talking about a cross-shaped life in this epistle, Paul gave two examples of this kind of a life. Number one, our Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 2 and Paul himself in chapter 3. If you remember that famous passage, that great Christological passage in Philippians 2 verses 6 to 11, Paul said, Christ as God humbled himself in becoming human and being obedient to death, even death on a cross. And for this reason, God highly exalted him or super exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name, that of the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, which means he is glorified now in heaven. You come to chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. Paul said he in turn suffered the loss of all former things like his credentials, uh, his pedigree, his zeal, etc., etc., because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ his Lord, so as finally to become confirmed to his death or in his death. And he was sure about the future glory that awaited him. Notice in both these cases, both in the case of our Lord Jesus Christ and Paul, there is suffering and then there is glory. Christ suffered and is now in glory. Paul and the Philippians also suffered, but they will attain glory later. So today's passage will reveal to us Two things that you and I must do to live a cross-shaped life. Uh, today and the next two days, we will be expounding on uh, various passages in the New Testament to talk about various aspects of sanctification or various ways of looking at sanctification. So today, uh, we're going to do an exposition of this small passage, which is Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. So Paul, in this particular passage, discusses the two features that I talked about that you and I must do 
to live a cross-shaped life. So it's going to be a simple message, a very practical one, two simple points on what you and I must do to live a cross-shaped life. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. I hope you're all there. And so the first thing, in verses 17 through 19, you will see that you and I must emulate godly Christians and avoid those who distract you from the heavenly prize. What do you and I need to do to live a cross-shaped life? The first thing is you and I must emulate godly Christians and avoid those who distract you from the heavenly prize, the inheritance that is laid up for us in heaven. You and I must follow men and women who walk the path of the cross and we must also steer clear of those who reject the cross in the way they live. That's a great and significant aspect of becoming confirmed more and more into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctification. That's exactly what Paul exhorted the Philippians to do. Paul told the Philippians to follow him, but beware of those whose minds are entirely on earthly things. I'll explain that to you. Because Paul, in explaining the importance of this, he did two things. What did he do? Look at the, uh, look at the outline, please, and follow along even as we look at this passage. First thing Paul did is Paul appealed to the Philippians to follow him and others who take after him in their lifestyles. Now notice verse 17 as I read it for you. Paul says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul's point so far in this epistle is that those who know Christ and have a clear vision of the glory that awaits us respond to present difficulties with joy. Not because they like to suffer, but because their joy is in the Lord. Now, as Paul in this passage binds together all these themes and concepts, he appeals to the Philippians to join together in imitating him. Now, hear me, please. The idea of imitation comes from Paul's Jewish heritage, where a pupil or a student learned not just by receiving instruction, but, but by putting into practice the example of the teacher. The one who imitates internalizes and lives out the model presented by his teacher. So Paul is asking the Philippians to together imitate him in two things. Number one, he's asking the Philippians to imitate him in suffering for the sake of Christ and the gospel. Number two, he's asking them to imitate him in behavior that exemplifies the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is asking them to take note of or be on the lookout for, depending on your version, those who walk in keeping with the example of Paul. Be on the lookout for such people. Take note of such people whose, whose walk is in keeping with the example of Paul himself. Most probably, Paul was referring to various itinerant preachers who visited the church at Philippi, and Paul himself was one of them. So the point here is that the Philippians had to observe those who walked in the way of the cross and were living in eager anticipation of the future glory that awaited them. And not just that, they had to follow them. They had to follow such people. Now imagine this with me. If somebody came to your assembly and said this, if you want to learn how to pray, follow me. If you want to be a faithful evangelist, follow me. If you want to see compassion in action, follow me. What would you and I think of a person like that? Now, none of us would dare to make statements like that, isn't it? Yet, six different times in the New Testament, Paul says, follow me. Follow me. Why did he say that? Did he think he was a perfect Christian? Was he a self-obsessed person? 
Not at all. Because in chapter 3 verse 12, just prior to this passage, he clearly states that he has not yet arrived at a spiritual perfection. He's still on the way there. Well then, what did Paul mean by saying, follow me? What he means is this. Follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Now think of the Christian life this way with me. Imagine this thing with me. The Christian life is a long parade from earth all the way to heaven. Think of it as a long parade from earth all the way to heaven. At the head of the line, right at the front, is our Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation. Step by step, he's leading his followers to glory. It's a long road with many twists and turns, but he's fully committed to seeing that we all make it to the end. And since the parade is long, we need people in front of us who can keep us on the track. We need mentors, models, heroes of faith, if you will. People who are farther along in the spiritual journey, who can keep us pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Without such input, we are likely to veer off the trail and end up in the wilderness. Let me ask you a question this morning, young people, and this is important. Who are you following? Who are you following? Who is up ahead of you showing you the way, pointing out the rough places on the road and making sure that you don't make the wrong turn. We all need people like that in our lives. None of us in our Christian lives ever reaches a point where you and I can say, I can do this on my own. I don't need anybody else. Now, some of us may have been Christians for a long time, for decades perhaps. But we need to realize that now as much as ever, we need the encouragement of being around people who pray better than we do, who witness more than we do, who have a deeper knowledge of God's word than we have. We need their example. We need their encouragement and the challenge they provide to our lives. This touches a very practical point, and I want you all young people to hear me, please. Would you like to learn to pray? It's not hard. Just hang around people who pray and pray all the time. Would you like to grow in joy? Spend time with joyful Christians. Do you wish you had a heart for the world? Spend time with missionaries and watch your heart change little by little. Are you struggling with a temptation? Find somebody who's fought the same battle and won that battle. Would you like to teach better? Find some gifted teachers, listen to them and learn from them. Follow faithful leaders and soon enough, their godly examples will make you a better Christian and help you in your sanctification. Help you to live a cross-shaped life. Let me ask you another question here. As I ask myself this question, who is following you? Now think again about the image of this great parade from heaven, from earth all the way to heaven. Jesus Christ once again is standing at the front of the crowd followed by a multitude of people. So you simply have to begin to follow the crowd that is in front of you. And as long as they're following Jesus and you're following them, you're perfectly all right. Now pause for a moment and look behind you. What do you see? Do you see all those faces peering in your direction? They've been following you and you didn't realize it. As long as you follow those who follow Jesus, you're well, and it's well with you. And as long as they're following you, as you follow Jesus, it is well with them as well. But if you make a wrong track or a wrong turn on the track, remember, there are men and women, boys and girls that you didn't realize on this path who are looking to you looking to your example. Right now, my dear brother and sister, someone is following you. Someone looks to you to show you the way or to show them the way. Someone prays because they heard you pray. Someone is watching you fight your personal battles. Someone is watching you make some decisions that are important in your life. Someone wants to be like you. 
Keep on the puck. Keep your eyes on the prize. Find some good examples in the Christian faith and follow them. And don't forget that somebody is following you as well. And as long as you follow others who are following Jesus Christ, it'll be well with you. It'll be well with the others who are following you. Don't let that somebody who's following you down. So Paul appealed to them to follow him and others who take after him in their lifestyles. Second thing, Paul warned them of many who are completely earthly minded and have abandoned the cross. On the one hand, Paul is asking the Philippians to follow him and others who take after him in their lifestyles. But secondly, Paul is also warning them who are completely earthly minded and have abandoned the cross. Look at verses 18 and 19. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Hear me, please. Why does Paul want them to keep their eyes on those who imitate him? It is precisely because there are many people whose walk is the exact opposite. Many walk as the enemies of the cross. Who are these people that Paul is referring to in this context? It is very difficult to identify. They haven't appeared so far in this epistle and they don't appear after this context again. Most likely, they are professing Christians who are not walking in the ways of the Lord or who think of themselves as walking in the ways of the Lord despite the way they live. These are the people that Paul had often warned the Philippians about. How do you identify these people? Paul gives a fivefold description of them and notice this very carefully. Number one, he calls them the enemies of the cross. What does it mean to be an enemy of the cross? Remember what Paul has said about Christ and himself in this epistle? We just, we just talked about it briefly. Christ, who was God, left the glory of heaven and he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. Paul, on his part, he counted all his credentials as a loss for the sake of Christ. This tells us that the cross stands as God's negation of human wisdom and human power. Did you hear that? The cross stands as God's negation of human wisdom and human power. The cross means death to our pride. And so it creates enemies of those who refuse to go that way. And it's particularly because of their conduct that Paul referred to them as enemies of the cross. In other words, those who don't follow Paul's pattern are enemies of the cross. And Paul says, don't follow the enemies of the cross. The second description, Paul says their end is destruction. Those who have abandoned the cross, both for themselves and as a model for Christian life, are destined for destruction. Paul, of course, is talking about the eschatological outcome the final outcome of those who are enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction. Don't follow them. Thirdly, Paul says, their God is their belly. Meaning these people are driven by fleshly impulses. Those who are enemies of the cross of Christ have failed to accept the death of the old self and also have disqualified themselves from the new life that is available to them in Christ Jesus because they were serving their own fleshly desires. Their God is their belly. Number four, their glory or their glory in their shame. The things that they glory in, the things that they boast about, Paul says they're actually shameful things in light of the cross. These are detestable things in light of the cross. Number five, they set their minds on earthly things. These are people who have abandoned the pursuit of the heavenly prize in favor of what belongs only to the present scheme of things, the earthly scheme of things. And remember for Paul, his mind is altogether set on Christ. 
and for him to live is Christ and to die is gain. But for the enemies of the cross, their focus is altogether earthward. Let me summarize their features for you so you may spot them very easily. Number one, they claim to be Christians. Their lives betray them. They live for self-gratification. They brag about their sins. They glory in their shame. They drag others down with them. They will destroy you if you let them. They're going to hell. Don't go with them. That's why Paul warned them of many who are completely earthly minded and have abandoned the cross. That will not help you in your sanctification. Let me ask you this question very sincerely as I ask myself this question. Do you follow the right people in your life? Brothers and sisters, we must follow godly examples because ungodliness ex expressed by unbelievers is enmity with and contradictory to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? The ungodliness expressed by unbelievers is enmity with and contradictory to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must learn to live a godly life because ungodliness is the antithesis of the gospel. Did you know that it is possible to contradict the gospel by how you live? Why? Because the gospel is who Jesus is and what he did to save sinners from their sin. Not merely from hell, although that is a blessed thought. It's a, it's a definite consequence of salvation that we are saved from hell, yes. But Jesus gave himself to purify a people for himself, for his own possession, who are zealous for doing good works. Let's not forget that. You know, I'm thinking of an illustration from the ancient uh, Persian culture. The ancient Persians would often play a game with a slave. They would take a slave at random and make him king for three days. They would lavish him with gifts and fine food and clothing and any kind of a pleasure that he desired. But there was a catch. What was the catch? At the end of three days, he would be killed. They had such morbid fun with that kind of a game. As I think about it, it reminds me of our world today. People enjoy the short-term pleasures of life with no regard for the destruction which looms large over their heads. Let me say it this way, and listen to me carefully, my dear brothers and sisters. Not every relationship is good for you. Some of you listening to me are aware of relationships in your life that are pulling you away from the Lord Jesus Christ. It may be an online relationship that seems innocuous for the moment or a friendship at school or college or with a neighbor or someone you've met at a social gathering or on a trip. God's point is very clear. If a relationship or a friendship is pulling you away from the Lord Jesus Christ, you must end it right now. Do it now. Stop making excuses, please. I can't tell you who needs to listen to this, but I know somebody does. Know the enemies of the cross. Mark them. Avoid them. There is no other way to attain the heavenly prize that is awaiting us. So that's the first thing that Paul is talking about in this passage, on how to live a cross-shaped life. It is by emulating godly Christians and avoiding those who distract you from the heavenly price. Then there's a second thing that you and I need to know, to live a cross-shaped life, and that is in verses 20 and 21. They say that we must remember that we don't belong here, and that our future is a glorious one with Christ. We must remember that we don't belong here, and that our future is a glorious one with Christ. In our life of sanctification, as we move forward to become more and more like Jesus Christ, we must remember that we live in this world 
but we don't belong to this world. And we have a heavenly prize awaiting us for which we must try. And that's what Paul told the Philippians. Paul reminded the Philippians of their heavenly citizenship and the ultimate prize that awaited them. How did he do that? He did that by clarifying two things for them. And that will be in the outline right there. First thing, Paul pointed them to their heavenly citizenship and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 20. This is one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the immediate contrast here that Paul is setting up. The people who walk contrary to Paul have their minds on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. Why should the Philippians imitate Paul and observe those who follow his ways? Paul says, because our citizenship is in heaven. Why should you and I emulate godly Christians? Because our citizenship is in heaven. And therefore, that's where our focus must be. Our future glory, in contrast to those whose end is destruction, is highlighted here in these verses. Paul is helping the Philippians and all of us to recognize that he and they, all of us together, are participants in the eschatological prize that awaits us. All of us are participants in the eschatological prize that awaits us. Paul's language here of citizenship needs to be understood against the background of their Roman citizenship. Now listen carefully, please. These words about citizenship would have had a very special meaning to the Philippians. Since the Philippian colony was granted Roman citizenship, although it was about 800 miles away from the city of Rome, the imperial capital. They lived in Philippi, but their citizenship was in Rome, 800 miles away. The city was governed by Roman law. They practiced Roman customs. So a Roman from Rome could go to Philippi and feel right at home. In a similar way, we live on earth, but our hearts are in heaven. As the song says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. To those Christians who lived in a city that took pride in its Roman citizenship, Paul is saying you have a higher citizenship than that of Rome. You are citizens of heaven. And just as your Roman citizenship greatly affects the way you live, even more should your heavenly citizenship affect the way you live here on earth. And that life ought to be a cross-shaped life, one that knows Jesus Christ in the power of his resurrection and yet participating in his sufferings. Now, Paul comes to the ultimate concern, which is with their living in the present as those who are in pursuit of the heavenly prize. The rest of the verse focuses on that. Look at that. From which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice Paul says, we eagerly await. There's an eagerness to it. It has the idea of a child standing on tiptoe, waiting for his daddy to come home in the evening from work. There's an eagerness. We eagerly await a savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And who do we await? Paul says, he's a savior. He's our savior. The Philippians would have understood the term in connection with Caesar, who was also regarded as a savior, small s. Why? Because Caesar saved them from any attack and war and protected that colony. But Paul reminded them that their savior, capital S, is from heaven and he is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Every tongue will confess his lordship in the end. And here is the ultimate reason for our rejoicing in the Lord. That is this, the Lord is our Savior, by whose grace we have been redeemed, and whose coming we eagerly anticipate, even as in our present troubles we are being confirmed more and more to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, the process of sanctification. So Paul pointed them to their heavenly citizenship and to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, 
Paul reassured them that their earthly bodies would be transformed to be like Christ's glorious body. Look at verse 21. Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself? What does Christ our Savior do when he returns? He will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. The emphasis here is on the bodily resurrection of believers. Paul is making a contrast here between our present bodies which are perishable and the transformed heavenly body which is imperishable. The present body is weak, prone to sickness, but one day at his return it will be raised in glory and power. Our bodies will be transformed into the likeness of the man from heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word transform comes from a Greek word that is the root of our English word schematic. Now some of you may be engineers or uh, even design, uh, design students. Uh, you've heard of the word schematic, isn't it? It means uh, a drawing or a diagram that looks at the inner workings of a device. Paul ends this section with a ringing declaration that one day God is going to rescheme our earthly bodies, redesign, re-engineer our earthly bodies. We will be raised from the dead and we will be re-engineered to be like his glorified body. In the words of one commentator, we will be raised and beautified. I like the sound of that. I want to be raised and I certainly want to be beautified as well. How is he going to do all of these things? Look at the next part of the verse. By the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Here is a final word of assurance to the Philippians. In keeping with the same power by which he will transform their present bodies that are suffering now, Christ in the same way will subject all things to himself including the Roman emperor in whose name people are persecuting the Philippian church. It simply cannot be said better than that, both for them and for us. Think of it. On that day, no more glasses, no more diseases, no more walkers, no more ICUs, no more COVID-19, no more cancers, no more strokes, no more false teeth, no more kidney failures, no more disease, and no more death. That's what Paul pointed to. That's a hope. That's the glory that awaits us. So let me ask you this question in closing, as I ask myself this question very sincerely. Do you think about the glorious prize that awaits you? Because it is absolutely pivotal in your sanctification. Do you think about the glorious prize that awaits you? Let me share this illustration here to make the point. There was a young woman who had been diagnosed with a terminal illness and she'd been given just three months to live. And as she was sorting out things and getting things in order, she contacted one of her elders and had him come to her house to discuss certain aspects of her final wishes. So she told him which songs she wanted sung at the funeral service, which scriptures uh, she would like read, and which outfit she wanted to be buried in, and all those things. Everything was in order, and the elder was preparing to leave. She prayed with the young woman, and suddenly the young woman said, I remembered something. There's one more thing that I want to tell you, uncle. What is that? Asked the elder. It's a very important thing, she said. I want to be buried with a fork in my hand, F-O-R-K, fork in my right hand. And the elder looked at the young woman, not knowing what this quite meant. And she, he was just puzzled. He just gave a puzzled look at her. And the young woman said, that surprises you, isn't it? And the an uncle said, yes, it does surprise me, to be honest. And then she went on to explain this. In all of my years of attending our assembly gatherings, where often there is love feast, 
I remember that when the dishes of the main course were being cleared away, somebody would inevitably come to me and lean over and say, keep your fork, keep your fork. She said it was my favorite part of being at the meal because I knew that something better was coming, like a velvety chocolate cake or a deep dish apple pie or something very tasty, something wonderful, something of substance is coming. And so I had to keep my fork. So I just want people to see me in the casket with a fork in my right hand. And I want them to wonder what's this fork about. Then I want you to tell them, keep your fork because the best is yet to come. An uncle's eyes welled up with tears of joy as she hugged the young woman goodbye. And he knew that this would, this would be one of the last times that he would be hugging her and seeing her before her death. But he also knew that this woman had a better grasp of heaven than most people that he had met. At the funeral, her body lay in the casket and uh, there she was and she had the right uh, in her right hand a fork. And everybody came next to the casket, looked at her, looked at her body. They were mourning over her, but they all wondered, what's with this fork? And as people were questioning, the elder who knew the answer smiled over and over again. And then he got onto the pulpit. During his sermon, he said this, that he had a conversation with this young woman three months before she died. And he told them about what's with the fork and what it symbolized to her. And he told the people that he couldn't stop thinking about her and about the fork. And they probably wouldn't stop thinking about that either. And he was right. So the next time you pick up a fork to have your lunch or something, may I request you ever so gently that you remind yourself that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Let me remind you, brothers and sisters, that despite appearances often to the contrary, God is in complete control of the situation around and that our salvation is not just for today, but forever and that Christ is coming again. And at his coming, we will inherit the final glory that belongs to all who are in Christ Jesus. So my question is, do you think about that glorious prize that awaits you. So what's the point of this morning's passage? The whole passage basically says, you and I can live the cross-shaped life by emulating godly believers and by pressing on toward the heavenly prize. We don't merely await the end, brothers and sisters, but we eagerly press on toward the goal, since the final prize is simply the consummation of what God has already accomplished through the death and resurrection of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me end with a small and, uh, and a brief illustration here, but uh, this is just to emphasize the point. Dr. David Livingston pioneered medical missionary to Africa. When he returned to Great Britain, he was asked this question by a reporter, where do you want to go from here? His answer was immediate and without hesitation. He said, I am ready to go anywhere, provided it be forward. I am ready to go anywhere, provided it be forward. My dear young brother and sister, I hope the Lord has spoken to you this morning through this passage. And I pray that if there's anything in your life this morning that is taking your focus away from the heavenly prize that awaits us, shun it, repent of your sin, and start walking by emulating godly Christians and always having your focus on the heavenly price that awaits for us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your patience. And once again, thank you, dear organizers, for the opportunity. May the Lord bless you all.